you know, I always felt bad for those uh, business people who were so cutthroat, battling it out in boardrooms, because I feel like there's there'd be little, very little trust. Mm. Because when you're swimming with sharks and you're a shark, you know, that's just the life you've built. Hey, Founder Fam, welcome back to another episode of the Founder Podcast. Now, whilst perhaps best known for his roles across Entourage, The Devil Wears Prada, Clickbait, over the past decade, Adrian Grenier has cemented his place as a social impact investor and activist, as well as a communicator on important and timely environmental issues, and also as a successful entrepreneur. So today we're talking about Adrian's successes in business and investing, but also his failures, moving beyond Hollywood to pursue a better future for the earth and the processes he takes to building eco-focused ventures and businesses. Please welcome to the Founder Podcast, Adrian Grenier. The first question that I ask everyone that comes on is, uh, how did you get your job, AKA, how did you find yourself doing the work you're doing today? Oh man. Yeah. I, well, first of all, I just have to say, um, count your blessings. I feel so privileged to be doing the work that I'm doing. Um, not only on, from an investment perspective, but just from, um, a, a work play, nourishing self-care perspective. Uh, I, I really, over the past couple of years, made a big shift and a big pivot in my life to reorient my life closer to family and nature and community so that, uh, you know, my, my life wasn't so lopsided, always working and gallivanting and traveling and really depleting myself. Now I have a nice balance where as I'm working, I'm replenishing my spirit, my soul, and really feeling very grounded, very, uh, at home, at home right in here. So, um, how did I get here? Well, <laughs> long, long time coming. I, I spent, uh, many years as a punk rebel in New York, playing in bands, making indie films, doing everything that I could to not make money, like everything in my power to do the opposite of making money. And I was, I was hugely successful in that. <laughs> very, very broke and uh, really had a, a great time just being in the craft, like learning skills and creating art, like being really expressive and viscerally um, connected to my craft as an artist, filmmaker, musician. And then eventually I, uh, you know, I was tired of, sleeping with five guys in, in an apartment and decided I wanted to make some money. And I started to find the path of least resistance. And that, that happened to be film and acting was the way I ended up um, being able to move out of the, the crash pad, so to speak. And after, in, you know, making uh, my, my way in the film business as an actor, I started making documentaries. So I went back to one of my true passions, which was filmmaking from a storytelling perspective, from a directorial and producer, uh, producer uh, standpoint. And then eventually it, that moved into a, a curiosity in the tech space and entrepreneurship. And I started connecting with founders and started my first couple of investments. We're, we're, we're just, you know, basically getting excited about a dude or, or a founder and being like, yeah, I want to help and just supporting in that way. Then taking a gander myself, like, wow, this can't be so hard. Let me do it. My, you know, let me start a business, started a couple of businesses, which didn't do very well. <laughs> um, and then finally, you know, found the maturity enough to bring it all into sort of resonance where I can, I can now invest. I have a team that is, are, are smart enough to like vet businesses so that <laughs> I don't just invest in anything and everything. Um, and I can really focus on the big picture, which is mission aligned vision and, and um, 
yeah, I, I, values. Hmm. Interesting. A few things I'd love to unpack there. So, um, man, I used to love Entourage. Like me and my buddies, like we used to watch it all the time. And like, dude, it was so cool. Like it's such a cool TV show. You used to? <laughs> Come on. You, you, you have Entourage bed sheets, I can tell. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really like, first of all, I've got to unpack. You said that you've changed your your life and how you live can you talk can you elaborate a little bit more around that around that lifestyle shift did you experience burnout or, or what happened or what caused this shift yeah i think a lot of times we youngsters well as youngsters uh, as youngsters we tend to be a little bit myopic and and and, and laser focus on one thing status, you know, finding your place in society and, and climbing the ranks socially and making money. And they're kind of, they kind of like support each other, right? If you can make some money, you get some status, you get access, you, you, you live a better life, you know, maybe you attract some, uh, you know, uh, females and, and that's really your, your main goal. Uh, and, and then now that I'm getting older, uh, you know, I've sort of realize that that only gets you so far in life and there's there's more to life and uh, i really wanted to ground into family and um take take things a little bit slower and be a little bit more uh, uh just i wanted to breathe every day i didn't want to be so uh, you know fast paced and, and always on the go without taking time to really take in my life in the world and and see how I can be of service. Some, you know, like wake up and smell the, the roses type perspective, but this time I'm actually growing roses instead of just buying them at the corner shop. So I, I, I moved my whole life onto land in, into nature. Mm. It's an interesting um, dichotomy though, because do you feel like, I don't know about you, but for me, it feels like sometimes like life is so short, time's running out. You want to make the most, you want to go, you want to go, you want to go. How do you balance, you know, you, and, and it can be really fun. Like I can see that you're a true creative and artist and entrepreneurs are, are, are the modern day artists, right? Be, you know, founders, they're modern day artists. So it's so much fun to get caught up in creating, creating, creating and getting caught up. How do you balance that? this kind of need to not want to miss out or to not want to, I guess, yeah, make, not, not want to lose time. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. It's, it's what is our relationship to our um, mortality, you know, and either, either we're playing a finite game in which we have limited time. So we got to get it all in and do everything. And by golly, doesn't matter how we, undermine our values and exploit what as long as we're getting to where we want to because time is of the essence and somewhere in the back of our mind there's that that death you know wish somehow that that fear that uh you know mortality awareness that's driving our our decision making and i guess what what i wanted to do was get out of that game and play the infinite game in which i recognize that the choices I make will inevitably create a future reality in which I get to be born again into and enjoy it. And it may not be this physical lifetime, but like maybe it's incarnate in through, through like my ch children. Like what if I have kids and what kind of world am I going to bring them into? And then if they have kids, can I make a better world for them in the far future? So really I start to play along an infinite timeline so the choices i'm making aren't so anxious and desperate but i can really lean into um longer term choices not only for myself my my longevity that may extend beyond because now i'm not burning myself out but beyond my physical life where i can give to future generations yeah no that makes sense so really focusing on being present as well yeah so Let's talk about your first business. 
Uh, you, you mentioned you started a few, so you invested, you invested a few in a few companies. What was your, you know, Alexa, before we talk about bi- this first businesses that you started, what were your first investments and what's been your most successful one? Oh man. Uh, I'm trying to remember what some of the first ones were. I honestly, like many of them, like the, the ones I remember are the ones that are still around that are, that are successful. Um, some of the, the flops, I guess, is, is so, well, one of the ones I'll just mention because it just keeps coming to mind is, uh, um, is uh, Just just Eggs. Do you know Just? Heard of it, yeah. Right. So it used, like, when it was like a totally different name, it was called Hampton Creek. They made mayonnaise and then moved, moved into um, eggs. That was, that's one that sort of stood the test of time. Um, but there were a lot of like small apps, like little app things that didn't, that just had no legs really. Ultimately, I didn't even understand what apps were. I, they called me app curious. I was very, I was like very interested in, oh, what is this app thing? You know, and I wanted to get in and I wanted to like create my own, uh, you know, there's one like called popcorn, um, uh, so, so many like just. I, I can't even remember. It's just like a wild ride of just all these excitable entrepreneurs trying to do this and me, me as well. And, you know, we had a lot of learning coming to us. Mm. What was, what has been some of your biggest learnings from those early days in investing in companies that you take into now? I, I think recognizing my own limitations, you know, sometimes one's ego might, make them think that they're going to be the, the, the CEO, the entrepreneur, the financier, you know, the, the face of the, the, the business, uh, the creative executive, you know, all the things. Um, and I realized early on that I, I had to know, you know, where I fit in, what my lane was, you know, where I was really adding value and where I needed to get out of the way. Um, and take the ego out of it and really just build a great company or support a company that has, that has a mature, responsible look at the way they're building or structuring their business. Um, you know, like hot shot CEOs, you can tell, or, or, or entrepreneurs, founders, you can tell when they're, they're not going to want to give up any power. And they're not going to want to let their baby grow. And a lot of times, you know, people are, are great at starting businesses, but not necessarily at growing them, you know? And so do, do these, do they have the maturity and the self-awareness, the introspection to know when to um, bring on other people and, 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 and ask for help? Mm. Yeah. You said a, a lot of uh, your investments, uh, in the early days were about the person and the founder and that was the big driver probably less around you know total addressable market the thesis you didn't probably have a thesis has that changed now or it's more still focused on the founder and you have it yeah oh it's yeah oh yeah it's changed big time i mean we're still focused on the founder you know it, it, they're especially startups are founder driven like you really want to know who's creating this business and are they, are they in it for the long haul? Or are they in it for the right reasons? Do they have what it takes to see it through all of the hurdles and challenges, especially in the early days of starting a business? I, I, I guess I should correct what I was, what I said is I was in it more for the ideas and I'm, I was easily swayed by the vision of the founder as a creative person. When someone tells me a story, like my, my brain lights up and I can imagine it. Yeah. You know, and, and so I seduce myself. I, I'm almost complicit with the founder in making me believe in the thing versus being more skeptical and poking holes. So another lesson I learned is, you know, just, you got, you got to learn to poke holes and kill your darlings. And there's a difference between a great idea and a great business. So I still get to dream and imagine, but I have a team now who can vet the, the, the business um, uh, you know, viability of a biz, of, of, a, of a company, um, you know, do, do the analytics, the numbers, the market research, et cetera, so that 
we know we're going to actually make a return and I can keep dreaming onto the next company as opposed to wasting a lot of time uh, on a, on a big idea that doesn't have legs. So yeah, now I do, I have, I have that support and that's great. I mean, that's, that was part of my whole learning curve, bringing in Bob Manuzzi, who is my, 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 my partner um, and her and, and how she approaches business. She's basically the brains of the operation. She tells me what we're actually going to put money towards versus uh, you know, what is just a fanciful idea or even, even better. Sometimes I'll bring an opportunity and she'll say, this is great, but here's another company that's actually more viable in the same space. Mm. So you guys started to contra ventures together, right? Yeah, correct. And that's kind of yeah. like your venture arm. You've also got uh, like an incubator as well, where you incubate businesses. I'm curious, uh, how did you meet Bar? Oh, how did I meet Bar? She, I think she reached out to me a few years ago because she has um, a family office where she represents um, people of influence with a, I guess a, a, a global or like a public presence who, and she wants to help them align their investments with their values, which was, of course, I was perfect for. Um, and we just got to know each other over the years before we finally realized that we had a lot in common, that we actually worked well together. And she helped me formalize my ragtag, arbitrary, shoot from the hip investments and make it into you know, formal uh, business thesis that we could actually raise money against. Mm. So I have to ask you this, um, you know, from all your accomplishments and success and then looking at a potential business partner, it would be hard to know who to trust, right? How do you, how do you know, like when it comes to kind of potential business partners, opportunities, because you would get so many things thrown your way. How do you kind of sift through, yeah, people that have ulterior motives probably don't have your best interests and they only have their own self-interests. Like, how do you know what, who to trust and how to trust others? Hmm. Like when it comes to stuff like that. Yeah. I, you know, I always felt bad for those uh, business people who were so cutthroat and were battling out, battling it out in boardrooms uh, because I feel like there's, there'd be little, very little trust because when you're swimming with sharks and you're a shark, you know, that's just the life you've built. But when you build, when you build a business from a different kind of integrity that requires um, real, real exchange of, of the human, human to human connection, I don't, you don't have to worry about that as much because you know that you're all playing um, for, for different reasons. And that's just, I think you, you meet the human before you make the deal, as opposed to a lot of times it's the deal at all costs. And I've always, I've, I've recognized over the years that there's smart money and then there's easy money and then there's heart centered money. Like people who really are aligned with what they mean and easy money is often very dangerous money because it always comes to bite you in the ass. It's like if anybody that wants to just give you a bunch of money, no strings attached and, and they're not asking questions, you, you know, it may be really um, convenient, but there's an opportunity cost there and it usually doesn't work out. That's from my experience. So it takes a, a period of vetting of a human being getting to know them really, truly. I, I got to know Bob over a couple of years before we started working together. So, I mean, she, she was playing the long con if she's actually not legit, which I would be surprised. And, you know, I, I might take my hat off to her. She is a con artist ultimately. <laughs> <laughs> so you started quite a few businesses, uh, Shift, Lonely Whale, you got the, the venture firm, and the incubator and earth speed media one of your newest ventures um what was your first business 
You said you, you said you started a couple and you learned some good lessons. Can you tell us about that? And was Shift your 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 first real big one or? Well, I started Reckless Productions, which was my production company, and um, I'm still operating that. Uh, you know, we basically do you know independent films come and go as you know over the years. Um, it's we're, we're not always making films, but um, it's really a vehicle for me to to produce and direct films. So that that was, I guess, my first formal f pr company. Um, one, one that was my favorite that didn't work out was Church Key Beer. I started a beer company. And man, that was a good time. And <laughs> tell us I about that. So much... What's that? Tell us about that, man. Yeah, I had high hopes for that. And in fact, I remember my agent called me and he's like, Oh, you bastard, like you're gonna be a you're gonna be a billionaire from beer, not acting. Like this is everyone loved this company. And it was great. We we actually brought back the flat top can. So these are the old cans the way our great grandparents used to drink beer. So before they had the pull tab or the like so the cans today, if you're if you're watching have the tab that stays on and it pops a little hole. Before, back in the day, our grandparents used to, have to use a tool, kind of like a can opener, but it cracks a little triangle in the top of the can. And so we brought that back and we were making beer in those old school tin cans. So they were like basically oil cans that were tough. You couldn't squeeze them and you had to crack them open. It was, it was awesome. And so we had this old hipster sort of nostalgia and um we had a craft beer it was micro craft all, all the things and you know who would who would have thought that starting a business is hard and we, and not only that the beverage business not only that the beer beverage business which is a pennies game like you got to sell a lot of this swill to make any money and we were doing a premium product we had like the fanciest cans it was all the all the things and you know people want cheap beer they, that's i mean that's the bottom line is they want to really they want they want to spend six bucks for a 24 pack not six bucks for a six pack you know so it's it it just ultimately didn't work the the, the real fundamental reason why it didn't work was we had some um canning problems because we were essentially reinventing the can uh because the whole of the beverage industry had moved towards standardization around aluminum stay tabs, which is what I just pointed out. And we were, we had to retool and recreate a whole canning line to accommodate this, this can. And it just was cost prohibitive considering our margins and the beer industry. We were number one in whole foods for, for a while. Uh, we were, very promising and then you look at the numbers and the uh, party's over mm, yeah interesting <laughs> why was it so much fun though <laughs> well i was really proud of the the concept i was really proud of the our premise and yeah our, our slogan was worth the effort you know the idea is like that which you put effort into is you know worth it you know ultimately and then you get the reward and um yeah i mean just i mean look i love i love beer right i love craft beer in particular and we had a great uh triple uh triple treated uh what was it <laughs> i'm trying to remember um hops a, a triple hops treated pill uh czech style pilsner which was really really tasty we I think I'd lost 10 pounds when that business went under. So that's how much fun weight I had gained. And, and when you're, when you're out selling the beer, like you, you gotta drink it, you gotta, you gotta be sure to be seen drinking your own product. So it was just a good time. I was a lot younger and I had a lot more energy. So. Mm. And how was it like, you know, from all your other success in, in other areas uh, with film and and music and all sorts of things? Like, how, how was that 
that failure like did it was it tough to work through or you just kind of kept going because that's your nature well you know the biggest the biggest thing the the, the hardest thing to re resist it's, it's one thing to fail you know they say fail fast because when you fail fast you learn and then you you adapt yeah but it's those of us that refuse to fail we don't want to fail so we hold on to failure so you're basically like hitting rock bottom and then sliding scraping your face across the stone as you hit rock bottom as opposed to just getting it over with so it took us like two years to finally accept that it was over and so I did not take it well. I did not want to fail. I wanted, it was like, okay, we got to believe in ourselves because we're going to be that one success story that we, we get to tell the war stories about how we almost failed, but we're going to like resurrect. It's really hard to know when, no, 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 this is, you're not going to be one of those resurrection stories. It's over. And, and that's, and you could keep pouring money into it and borrowing money and trying to save face, salvage a dream. But you could prolong agony and it's a huge opportunity cost if you don't know when it's over, when the party's over, right? It's like when, when you go out and you're at a club and the lights come on, you've probably overstayed your welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you got to know when it's over and it's probably not at the very end. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. So, um, Let's talk about shift. I saw that, uh, did you, did you exit that company or you're not active anymore or? Yeah. So sh shift, uh, my partner, I, I left shift many years ago and, uh, my partner took it over and he's actually just relaunching it. Yeah. Okay. Got you. Um, and your most recent Lonely Well Foundation and also Earth Speed Media. Can you tell us about those companies and what you're trying to? Yeah, and always, always with like a, a an element of social good. All of your all of your ventures, businesses you invest in. Yeah. Uh, so Lonely Well, uh, I started Lonely Well whew, almost seven eight years ago, uh, whose mission was to bring people closer to the world's ocean. Um, and we found ourselves at the forefront of plastic reduction in, uh, in the oceans. And we started several programs to reduce um, plastic going into the oceans and bringing awareness around our plastic use. And uh, that was, you know, I, I became a UN environment ambassador because of that. And we, we had, you know, we had a good run. We did a lot of great things and I'm very proud of uh, the work we've done. We worked with, uh, we had a program called Ocean Heroes Boot Camp, and we hosted kids from around the world and and brought them together in sort of a boot camp style conference where they learned about ocean conservation and had games and activities and became advocates for the ocean when they went home. Uh, we started a supply chain for ocean plastic, like really behind the scenes, B two B, boring stuff, but it was really is really effective, it's still growing. Um, yeah, just a number of things, and uh, yeah, super proud of Lonely Well. Yeah, amazing. And Earth Speed, tell us about that. Yes, yeah. So Earth Speed's my latest venture. Um, Earth Speed Media. It's a it's a um, nature based lifestyle media company, and our our mission really is to bring people more into resonance with nature and the earth, and um, not only pr providing content, which is aspirational, and inspirational to bring people closer to, to nature, but also uh, eventually coming into next year, hopefully sooner than later, we're going to be offering uh, retreats and experiences, nature courses, uh, primitive skills, different ways that people can actually get out into nature and um, get their hands dirty. Interesting. And, uh, what uh, compelled you to get back in front of the camera with with Earth Speed? <laughs> if I if I had to hire someone comparable, it would be too expensive. <laughs> I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm curious as well, like uh, when it comes to the you know the tone of Earth Speed, how do you guys uh, plan to kind of differentiate yourself? 
compared to other environmental media? I, you know, I wouldn't even look at it as environmental media. I think it's more, it really is lifestyle. It's like sort of, um, I, I, I'm a real fan of um, a lot of homestead channels, you know, a lot of DIYers, people who are doing, uh, doing the work and they're learning hard skills and they're taking care of themselves, self-sovereign, independent, uh, saving money, getting healthy, taking care of their family, being responsible citizens. I just really love that community. And, you know, I have a, a, I have an awareness. I have a platform that sort of spans pop culture and, you know, modern culture. So I, I thought, well, Hey, I could maybe bridge the gap between those, those two worlds and make something extremely accessible and modern and open, but still nudging towards this, um, this modern homestead kind of uh, lifestyle. Mm. Yeah, look, that's a massive movement for sure. Yeah, totally. Yeah, look, that makes sense. Um, so we have to work towards wrapping up. Uh, we're going to move to the hot seat round. Um, ah. Hot seat. So rapid fire Ooh. questions and answers. Um, okay. What's your favorite spot? to spend time on your farm? Favorite spot to spend time on my farm? Yeah. I There is a seat in the garden underneath the palm tree. And I gotta say, we do have a palm tree, isn't that? There's one great thing about this area is we have a climate that accommodates all sorts of growth. So we have three growing cycles every year, and then we have palm trees and we have fruit trees, we have banana trees, we have all sorts of great, awesome growth um, without being in the tropics. And it's just a great little chair that when I'm sweating too much, I just take a, I kick my feet up and sit under the palm tree. Is it ever enough? Is that the question? Is it ever enough? Mm. This it, it, I think we'd have to find out what this it is. I would imagine it is probably enough. Yes, it is enough. When is work fulfilling? Well, you know, as I say, when you uh, find a job that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. So work is fulfilling when you work not with your head or your body, but with your heart. Who is Adrian going to be in 10 years? Hmm. I will be a father in 10 years. I will hopefully have many children. And um, yeah, I, I think I will have finally settled into uh, a community that is really close knit and tight and we're going to be having big old parties parties that like like 50 year olds would feel good at <laughs> <laughs> last question if you could have dinner with any entrepreneur dead or alive who would it be and why oh my god michelangelo is he in there? no is he <laughs> well he's an artist but is he a business builder? I figured. I thought he must started something, right? He's, he 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 built a lot of things. Yeah. Okay. All right. Michelangelo. That's. I'm. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Done. Awesome. Well, look. Thank you so much for your time, Adrian. It was an absolute pleasure. Great to connect and uh, thank you for being so open, honest and vulnerable and uh, congratulations on all your success thus far and uh, looking forward to continuing to follow your journey. Thank you and thanks to everybody here. Awesome. Um, also, one last question. Where's the best place people can find out about yourself more and your work? Yeah, right now we're promoting EarthSpeed. So it's at EarthSpeed uh, on Instagram and YouTube. I'm at Adrian Grenier, mostly uh, all over all the channels. That's about it. Awesome. Boom. 
Hey Founder Fam, did you love this interview? Well, if you did, then make sure to subscribe. We're dropping new interviews every single week and we can't wait for you to join the journey. All right, we'll see you soon.